Well, guys, after the longest drought lander yet, we finally get the return that changes the show as we know it. Don't change the channel. Don't touch that dial. We got it all on you and Jim. Take off your speakers. Over the sea to Hey guys, it's Cameron for Outlander, Season 3, Episode 1, The Battle Joined. And guys, it has been a long time since I reviewed this show. I mean, uh, it seems like it was years ago when we were talking about the events of Season 2. You know, with Claire discovering that Jamie's alive at Crane of Dune, saying she has to go back. That feels like it was ages ago. And there's been so much TV since then. Uh, I... I didn't forget about this show, but, you know, it was one of those things where I'm like, when's this finally coming back? Like, I didn't think we were going to get this this year. I thought this was going to come back next year, but thankfully we did, in fact, get it this year. And did this premiere disappoint? Absolutely not. This was a fantastic premiere that was definitely different than what we've come to know from the show, but I think that's something we should expect. I mean, you know, if you guys remember, the way things left off um, in the previous season, the way things actually did leave off there, uh, that itself was very different. The season finale was very different, and I think from here on out, this is going to be a very different kind of show, but I'm definitely all for it. You know, shows need to evolve, and this is the perfect example of that, but let's just get into this episode because there definitely is a lot to talk about. This episode has two very significant halves. You have the side where it's about Culloden and Jamie's realizing he's alive, and then you have sort of like the Claire Frank catch up arc. So we're going to get into both of that. But we start off and we see Jamie um, right where basically we see immediately we're shocked to see the carnage of the completed battle of Culloden. Basically, the battle of Culloden's commenced, and I like that they didn't show us the actual battle because I've talked about this before. Outlander, while it may be epic, it's not Game of Thrones. It's just not. And that's something I think the show knows very well. That it is, to its core, a sci-fi romance, and that's what the show really is. Yes, there are definitely graphic and violent scenes in the show, but it's not Game of Thrones. It's not so much about the battle. We only really see what we want to see. We see there are piles of bloody bodies, mostly Scots, all over the moor of Culloden, also because we know the outcome of the Battle of Culloden. Like, you guys can look up what happened if you guys were, you know, really disappointed we didn't get to see it. I personally wasn't upset we didn't get to see the Battle of Culloden. You know, we already know the outcome, so the British are walking through moving bodies or kicking bodies to see if they are alive, and if a sound is uttered, the sky God then gets a bayonet for their answer, and we eventually find Jamie on the field. He's got a red coat on top of his seriously injured body, and basically, you know, obviously there's a lot of dead weights, um, you know, the, of a full-grown man lying on top of you as you fade in out of consciousness, you know, and I love the way the scene's constructed, because he's just in, like, a pile of bodies. All these other bodies, they're lifeless, they're not moving, but Jamie is very much alive, and, uh, basically, we see that he's actually the one that finally we see also right next to him is the body of Black Jack Randall. So he flashes back from the present situations of pain to the circumstances of the pre-battle conversation and actual killing blows as they engage the British on the field. We get one more drinking game shot of whiskey as Bonnie Prince Charlie says, mark me one more time, and uh, basically Jamie, and uh, yeah, so Jamie actually did get to kill Randall, and that was awesome to see. After two seasons of Randall just completely outright torturing Jamie, and, you know, sexually and emotionally, all the stuff he did to him, it seems like this is finally behind him, and... I definitely really did like seeing that. I'm glad to see that Jamie is moving forward in that regard, but basically, he does flash back to when he actually did send Claire through the stones, and he stands there alone after she's gone, and uh, we saw Claire's reaction the first episode of season two, but now we see Jamie left in his own time, clutching Claire's blanket before he returns to the Jacobite army. The battle is, is uh, much as Claire described it to Jamie, and with the British having heavy artillery, there being a greater number, the Jacobites were actually slaughtered, though they did take some of the British with them, and as the battle continued, Jamie saw Blackjack across the field almost at the same second as Blackjack saw Jamie. They ch they charged toward each other, and the ultimate personal battle pretty much did ensue here. During the fight with Blackjack, Jamie actually re received a horrible slash that created a very large gash across his upper thigh. I mean, again, this is like fight to the death at this point. So for that little give Jack, uh, Blackjack paid with his life, Jamie then struck Randall with a fatal blow with his dirk, and uh, both men stumbled 
wobble, they slash in the air as each other as they continue to ramble closer together on their wobbly legs. And uh, he reached out and touched Jamie's chest as both collapsed, Randall on top of Jamie. And again, it was just awesome to see. It's been a long time coming, and I just really loved seeing Jamie get the upper hand here. That was definitely awesome to see. So, in his fevered and painful state, throughout this episode, Jamie's going in and out of consciousness, and you don't know when he's gonna wake up. You know, obviously, that he is gonna wake up, because obviously we know he's alive, but basically, most of his arc is him kind of drifting in and out of it. He even envisions Claire coming to find him, and it actually turns into Rupert, and, uh... Again, this was a shock, because as we know, Jamie tells Rupert to let him so he can die, uh, so he, let him be so he can die where he is, because, remember, Jamie's original plan was to die. He was going to fight until he was the last one left, and then he would die, and that's really his plan. Claire didn't think he survived because of that reason, but basically, Rupert is very stubborn. Uh, Rupert actually died, um... Basically, you know, he's very stubborn about this, so you know he's not just going to let Jamie die there. But basically, the scene then changes to reveal Claire and Frank looking at a house that will become their new home in Boston 1948. We pretty much pick up right where the season 2 premiere left off, which it's been a long time, so I'll just back you guys up real quick. If you remember, Claire actually did return um, to where they were staying in Scotland and... Frank, you know, he was kind of upset that Claire uh, had been with Jamie and didn't really know how to react to it, but Claire basically promised him that she would try to move on, and that's kind of what she's doing here, but obviously it's a bit of a struggle. I mean, all that time she's had with Jamie, and now suddenly she's back in the 40s. I mean, yeah, there definitely are quite a few very drastic changes here. I mean, imagine if you were in the... Um, 1700s for like two years of your life and you pretty much become accustomed to like all of the traditions and things like that and uh you just you you get very used to it you know you, at first obviously it's a little bit strange but eventually you would get used to it but then unfortunately you end up back in the 1940s i mean yeah it would be quite a transition because to say that things change um a lot you know technologically um, physically, you know, uh, in terms of safety, all that stuff, I mean, it's an understatement, it really is two completely different times, and as they go through the rooms, politely talking as couples do about what the rooms, uh, would be used for, things feel actually a bit forced on Claire's side of, um, the conversation basically so months pass quickly in the modern period claire's fighting the stove she's trying to cook a meal over a pilot light determined to stay out on the stove and uh basically she blunts out signature favorite phrase of um and she goes to a much needed seat on the couch being most of the way through the pregnancy you know basically um you know, she's on her back and her feet are, her back and her feet are very much demanding it. Like, this pregnancy, she's very far into it. You know, this baby's ready to pop out at any second. And as she's sitting there, she takes a hard look at the fireplace and, uh, ingenuity of a mother strikes again. She goes and buys firewood. She's going to cook over the open flame in the fireplace and a neighbor woman then sees her taking the firewood out of the trunk and comes to help. So they get to talk about how husbands like or don't like surprises from their wives. And, uh, I thought this was a really good scene because it's kind of juxtaposing. What we get next is kind of a juxtaposition, um, like I said, of how 40s, you know, typical 40s women were to how Claire really is. Because Claire, as we know, is very independent. That's something that Jamie knew. That's something that Frank knew. And that's something I really have loved about these characters. I mean, they haven't really treated Claire, you know, like she's a modern 40s woman, which, I mean, she was in the beginning of the show, but she's grown so independent and so self-assured um, that you can tell that Frank, you know, he's not controlling her in any way, and that's something I definitely really did uh, like here, is the fact that she really isn't that way, and you know, obviously the 1940s women were obstructed to pretty much just cooking clean and that was it. That's kind of what they were ordered to do. Um, but obviously Claire's done a lot more than that. And, uh, you know, that's kind of something I think Claire should appreciate. That they both kind of allowed her to be who she was. And I think this scene very well does show that. That, you know, this women's talking and Claire's not really relating because she hasn't really gone through the same kind of thing that that woman has. And I thought, again, that was just very well done. But we go back to the 1740s. We see the Jacobites who remain alive. They found refuge in a small farmhouse near the battlefield. And Jamie can hardly move. Many others in the farmhouse are also injured in various ways. And... Rupert is trying to get Jamie to drink some water as other Scots lay around them. Some are standing near the doors or windows trying to keep an eye out. The British are still close, and they're traveling throughout the area looking for survivors. So, 
anyone else, you know, they're just going to make sure that they're dead, and that's just kind of the way that that's going to go. So, in 1948, Claire gets the immeasurable joy of meeting Frank's boss, and this probably was one of the biggest scenes of the episode, because this guy's like the very typical man of that era, because Claire's voicing her opinion on a very active political topic, as she usually does, and the man admonishes Frank for not keeping a closer watch on his wife. How could he let her speak freely like this? You know, how does a woman have any say whatsoever? He even casts aspirations on her time as a combat nurse that, oh, that means nothing. You know, you didn't really do anything whatsoever. We did the real fighting here. I mean, this guy's just a disaster. He really is. But again, that is how men back then really did talk. And I thought this was honestly very realistically portrayed in that regard. They weren't trying to um, sugarcoat in any way. This is very well how men in that time period acted. And I did like the way that they showcased that here. Uh, because... You know, uh, that's something that uh, males genuinely did do then, and I thought that was definitely very well done, um, and we did very well, um, again, see that here. It's the way that this guy was towards Claire um, is very similar towards how men in that time period really did act. So in the farmhouse, the British are finding the men, and Lord Melton then storms in, and Rupert informs the Redcoats that they are all traitors, and Lord Melton informs them that he'll be given the dignity of a bullet as a soldier instead of the hangman's noose, uh, which is not really a fair trade, but it is a nice gesture because hanging is, you know, obviously a lot more gruesome because uh, it takes so long. But if you're just shot, you know, it's just kind of that's it. And, uh, you know, basically, again, this guy, he's going to make sure that the soldiers that are still alive are taken out very quickly. So, you know, that someone's going to die. You know, obviously, it's not going to be Jamie, but, you know, definitely someone's going to die here. And it actually does get very devastating a little bit later on. So at breakfast in Boston, Claire's trying to lay the table and she notices is uh, a bird just outside the window and what I love about this episode is that it's not necessarily just Jamie that she misses it's the little things like a bird for example you know it's kind of just the small things that draw her back to Jamie just the littlest of things here and there and you can clearly see the shadow of Jamie cross Claire's face in that moment and Frank then comes into the kitchen they start talking about the differences between American tea and English tea and Claire mentions that she would like to apply for American citizenship and She's clearly cast her affinity for the English citizen she once was. She's just not that anymore. You know, she used to be, um, you know, your typical British um, type of, you know, type woman, but she's just really not that anymore. And she would like that their child to have a real home in America, which as we know, that is in fact where Brie ends up growing up years later. So as Frank reaches to touch her stomach after Claire uses the words their child, she dodges his touch. And Tobias Menzies, again, he really shows his range in the scene. And the fact that he can go from playing someone like Randall, who's just so dastardly and menacing and just, um, so evil to someone like Frank who is so genuine but at the same time he does have this rage in him but he's just really trying to be a good husband uh he just really plays those roles incredibly well and uh they do have a bit of a battle here about how Claire is keeping Frank at a distance and he doesn't understand how they can be married if she's just going to reject his touch and she goes in this whole thing that all he wants is sex but he says that's really not what it is at all and you know, I thought this was definitely a very well done scene, the way that it was done. Again, it's just really showing the difficulties between these two. Uh, life is not as easy as it was for them then, and there definitely is a lot for that Frank is still kind of getting used to here. He's not used to this side of Claire, and I think it's going to take him a while to really get used to it, but I think he's at least willing to put in that work. He's at least going to try. So, basically... Time in the 1940s has passed quickly through months of Claire's pregnancy. The time in the past after the battle has actually been but mere days. It's not like, you know, we're seeing uh, it's decades and things like that. The British are taking the men out of the farmhouse by one by uh, one by one and shooting them. And after logging their names, of course, for the crown, and Jamie is almost too weak to speak, but he's alive enough to hear each of his fellow men shot just outside the door, and Rupert comes over to say farewell and to step up to take his turn with the firing squad, and Jamie He's left to hear his cousin die at the end of a bullet out of an English musket, and I mean, it's devastating. You know, Rupert, this is the person that really saved Jamie. Jamie probably would have been dead if it wouldn't be for Rupert, and the fact that Rupert took this bullet for him, I mean, it's definitely very sad to see, but as you guys know, I've never been the hugest fan of most of these, um, 
characters, you know, like the ones in Jamie's Army. And not that they were bad, but I never really found them to be all that interesting. But Reaper was a character I always did really enjoy, and I'm definitely going to miss him for sure. But we knew that because a lot was changing here, and obviously a lot of time has passed, that we definitely were going to lose some guys. I mean, that's definitely was inevitable, but... Frank is lying on the couch. He's listening to all the things that make noise in a room in the middle of the night. The sink is dripping, the clock secondhand ticking, the fire cracking. It's all really getting to him. And he goes to his desk. He starts to pen a letter to the Reverend in Scotland when Claire then comes into the room with her coat on. She announces that her water has broke and the hospital is the next stop. And obviously she's about to have the baby. So now that all the men in the farmhouse who could stand or move on their own have been um, dispatched, the British soldiers actually are down to rest, Jamie being one of that lot, and Lord Meldon asks who of the men left wants to go next, and Jamie naturally speaks up. He wants to be the next one to go, um, but he told Claire that he intended to die, and he still does. You know, he doesn't want to live. He wanted to die so she could get on with her life, and as he's giving his name to the soldier to write it on the list, Lord Meldon stops short. He recognizes the name, realizes that he has a serious problem on his hands, that Lord Meldon happens to be the elder brother of John William Gray. And if you remember, his younger brother owes Jamie a debt in honor for not, um, you know, a debt of honor for uh, not offing him. If you remember, you know, uh, John William Gray was the one who he tried to pickpocket from Jamie and, you know, he caused this whole holdup, but Jamie actually set him free. But, so basically, Jamie can continues to tell the man to just kill him anyway. He doesn't care, and uh, he doesn't mind if he does it instead of John Gray, and Lord Meldon insists on satisfying his family's debt, so he sends Jamie home, bouncing along in the back of a cart. So yeah, Jamie's actually... Um, not, you know, uh, actually is, a, you know, obviously we knew he got to live, but yeah, he actually got off scot-free here, which I definitely did, like, seeing I thought that was definitely, uh, very well handled here, and I did like the way that was constructed, but Claire is then in labor at the hospital, but then the men take matters out of her hands, the doctor takes Claire down the hall to the delivery room, they forcibly puts her to sleep, instead of letting her have the baby naturally, and she protests, but it's kind of hard to fight, uh, their anesthetic once you get it forcibly, so, you know, it, once you get it, you can't really say no. So Frank's told to go down to the waiting room. When Claire wakes up, she's clearly in the same fear as she was when Faith was miscarried. She's very worried that it's going to happen again because she knows exactly what happened um, last season. You can tell she's got that fear in her again. That is until she sees Frank enter with the baby in his arms. They decide to make a fresh start of things and be a family of three. All really looks well again, at least until the nurse asks where the beautiful little angel got red hair, and obviously that's something that she's gonna have to, you know, uh, just face, the fact that this baby looks nothing like Frank, and that is the way this episode ends. Really great stuff overall, but let's just get this episode where it's gonna take us into the season as a whole. Like I said, there wasn't, like, a lot happening in this episode, but at the same time, there really was, because, I mean, on Claire's front... Um, there wasn't really a lot going on. There was basically just her kind of adjusting to normal life or lack of, because even in the 60s we've seen, it really doesn't ever, um, you know, it's never back to normal for Claire. I don't think that's ever going to be the same. You know, when you spend so much time with someone and you're so used to a certain period, uh, that kind of becomes your whole lifestyle. Claire is just, she doesn't belong in this time period anymore. I think she very well does know that. She doesn't belong here um, you know, she's now someone who is constantly hearkening back to the past, and I think that's just going to be her inner weakness. Uh, but we, I am very interested in seeing how this really did work out between Claire and Frank. Did they make their marriage survive? What really became of it? Because, I mean, all we really know about Frank is that he died. We don't know how that was. We don't know how their marriage really worked out. All we really know is that he died, the two of them raised Brie together, and uh, that they did have, it seems, a good marriage, but we'll have to see the way that really does go down, because, I mean, just like we see at the end of the episode, Claire's always going to be questioned with, why does your baby have red hair? Why does your baby look like this? Why does it look nothing like Frank? I mean... It's not something that's really easy to swallow. It's really not. You know, these are not answers that are easy. I mean, for Claire, sure they are, but they're also not easy because it just reminds her of when things were better. And for her, 
this is not really the ideal lifestyle she wants anymore. You know, we saw that. We saw that even the fact that she wants to apply for American citizenship. She just it does not feel like a typical English woman anymore. That's not who she is. She is much more, um, you know, into the culture. She kind of wants to branch out and pretty much start anew. But at the same time, she longs to go back, obviously, to the 1700s. And I thought there were just some really great scenes there. Um... I thought that definitely was very well done. But on Jamie's side of things, there was obviously a lot going on. We lost some really significant characters, specifically Randall Rupert supposedly, and I'm going to say supposedly because we didn't actually see his body, but Murtaugh supposedly is dead. Uh, I don't know if they actually killed someone like Murtaugh. He was such a fan favorite character in season two. I don't know if they could, if I could actually see them killing him off. I, I can see Murtaugh possibly lasting, but I guess time will tell. We'll just have to see the way that really does turn out. Uh, but it was definitely very ballsy to kill Randall. I didn't think Randall have much time left, but I didn't think he was going to die in this premiere. I thought this was going to be his last season, but no, Randall already is dead, and what this means, unfortunately, is kind of tragic. It means that we might not have that much time left with Tobias Menzies, which is really unfortunate because he's been one of the best parts of the show. I mean, I've given him so many compliments before. I've, just, I've talked about him enough. He is just an absolute genius when it comes to the show, and Unfortunately, I don't think we're going to have much time with him left. I think it's going to go maybe two or three more episodes, and then that might be the end of Tobias Menzies. I mean, maybe there'll be flashbacks. Maybe we'll see some, you know, visions here and there, but I don't think we're going to see a lot more of him, you know, regularly, um after maybe the first half of the season. I just don't really see him lasting that much longer, which again is unfortunate, but at least the show is moving forward. I'm glad to see the show's trudging forward, and I'm happy for it. I'm glad to see that. You know, I always enjoy when shows do evolve, and that's what the show is essentially doing. It's evolving where Jamie's gonna go. Jamie's very different now. He was ready to die. You know, he was, he didn't really want to live, so what do you really do when you are essentially forced to live? How do you press on without the person you care about? Of most without your child without all the men you've come to know how do you really press on i mean sure jenny's there and everything but how he really uh, goes on after this i think is really anyone's guess so we'll have to see the way that really does turn out i did hear that jamie is very different after this so i don't again i don't want you guys to tell me just like every single season i don't want to know what happens i just i like being surprised and that's just kind of the way uh, things do go here. But overall, guys, I definitely did love this premiere. I'm really loving where we are going with this season. And I'm absolutely going to give the season premiere of Outlander, Season 3, Episode 1, The Battle Joined, in A-. minus. So over, guys, for this episode of Outlander, the most guys thoughts episode overall, left your thoughts, and I am so happy that the show is back. Trust me, guys, it has been a long time coming, and I'm so excited to talk about Outlander again, but let me know guys thought this episode, loved your thoughts in it, and I will see you guys in my next video, and I will see you guys for that. Okay, bye.